Good afternoon once again. Welcome to the second day of the BBBA Tax and Regulatory Update. My name is Disislava Miteva and I'm the Executive Director of the British Bulgarian Business Association. Today we will focus on Brexit and legislation related to it. If we could move on with the slides. Thank you. Before we start with the presentations, I would like to thank all our annual sponsors. Thanks to them, we have the opportunity to broadcast live and uh, free of charge today and throughout the year, all our knowledge sharing webinars. Big thank you to Deloitte, Athlon, Cleves, Landmark, Bulgarian Insurance and Novotel Hotel Sofia. Thank you for your ongoing support. Very quickly, I will go through the webinar basics. As you know, for the attendees, the chat will be disabled. So please use the Q&A panel to raise questions. We will have five minutes dedicated to, for questions after each presentation. So don't wait until the end of the presentation. You can ask your questions during the presentation as well. So the speakers can uh, take their time to, to respond afterwards. Of course, if there are too many questions and uh, we do not have enough time, our speakers will respond to you following the webinar in writing. Note that the webinar is recorded and it's also broadcasted live on Facebook. So you will be able to share it with your colleagues and partners uh, after we finish. It's, go it's promising to be very interesting and uh, Brexit is raising a lot of questions on, on a daily basis. And what better person to introduce us to the future relationship uh, between the UK and uh, the EU than Tim Buissere, country director in Bulgaria for the Department of International Trade and the board member of the British Bulgarian Business Association. Tim, the floor is yours. Uh, Deti, thank you very much. That's very kind. And um, thank you for organizing this event as well, which is, um, as you say, very timely and important, I think. And thank you all for joining today. Um, this is one of those days when I think we're all quite glad to be working from home <laughs> with uh, thick snow outside. Um, as, you, as you will all know, of course, um, uh, there was a trade and continuity agreement uh, signed between the UK and the EU on the 24th of December, just before Christmas, um, just in time, we might say, um, which then took effect, uh, otherwise known as the deal, uh, which then took effect, um, of course, from the 1st of January this year at the end of the UK's transition period for leaving the EU. Um, and I have to say that, of course, we're all very happy that this, this deal was was agreed in the end, uh, almost at the last moment, um, not just because it provides some level of certainty for us all planning forward, um, but also because I think it provides a good platform of, let's say, a demonstration of goodwill, um, a, you know, goodwill and a good basis for cooperation going forward. Um, that's very important, I think, in, in these circumstances. Um, it begins. It brings certainty in different areas, uh, in trade, of course, in, in our business relationships, which is, which is the main um, topic of concern to us, but also in other areas, in areas like our security relationship, which is also a very important um, uh, a, a part of our relationship between Bulgaria and the UK, and, and, and in our people-to-people -people relationship as well. So, you know, this is a very broad deal and, and one that's going to form the basis for our relationship going forward for, well, probably for years to come. Um, just specifically on the trade agreement, um, you're probably aware that uh, the agreement um, allows for uh, unprecedented 100% tariff liberalization. So no tariffs or quotas um, on uh, trade in goods between the UK and Bulgaria, which is, which is great. Um, it does, uh, there is of course a, um, a, a, a caveat to that around rules of origin. So goods have to meet certain rules of origin in order to qualify for zero tariffs. Um, the, the, the agreement also supports trade in services to some degree, and some of the presentations today are going to touch on that topic in a lot more detail. Um, it also um, includes uh, certain um, facilitations around what are called technical barriers to trade to, to allow um, uh, goods to pass more easily. 
um, including on areas like the sanitary and phytosanitary measures. So the movement of, of goods, which are essentially food and drink products or meat and, meat and, uh, meat and dairy products. Um, I appreciate that these changes, of course, um, these will be changes for many businesses as they trade between Bulgaria and the UK. Um, and change is always difficult. People have to come to grips with new regulations. Uh, it can be a bit discouraging at first, perhaps. Um, and, you know, and there have been some well-publicized cases of businesses coming to grips with the new regulations since the 1st of January. Uh, what I can say is that we're here to help. Um, this is our job at the Department for International Trade. And our partners at the BBBA are also helping us too, to help companies to make sense of the new regulations and to keep business flowing. So if you have any questions or concerns about how this is all going to work going forward, um, please don't hesitate to contact us and we'll do our best to help. Um, and I'm sure that there may well be some difficulties in the short term, but we'll, we'll overcome them and um, we'll build on them and we'll keep our business moving forward. Um, I think that's all I need to say now, Desi. Um, let's hand over to the experts and find out more about some very specific topics relating to our business relations after Brexit. Thank, Thank you, you so Desi. Much. Thank you so much, Tim, for this introduction. Yes, you're right. We at the British Bulgarian Business Association, together with uh, the British Embassy, are trying to navigate the businesses through the labyrinth of so many uh, different notes and a lot of information regarding Brexit. I don't think there, there is a problem of lack of information. It's more a question of plenty of information and uh, the difficulty to find exactly what, what you need. Uh, today we have a very rich agenda uh, and I'm very grateful to the experts from Deloitte, DGKV, Kambura Fund Partners and New Balkans Law Office for agreeing to share their expertise with um, our participants uh, in the webinar. Well, first we will start with people movement, then we will move to protection of European trademarks. We will touch upon customs and VAT implications of Brexit and we will finish with the very important issue of uh, the impact on cross-border dispute resolution. So um, four presentations today, we should finish by six o'clock. Without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Nicolai, Nicola Semenu from Deloitte to talk about the legal and tax aspects of movement pe of people after Brexit. Nikki, the floor is yours. Thank you, Desi. Uh, thank you, Tim. Indeed, uh, 2020 has been a very, let's say, extraordinary year with Brexit being really the icing on the cake. So very interesting thing happened. And uh, yeah, we have to deal with this. And really, we saw some things that we would never have thought like happening, like uh, no more free movement, the UK third country, visas, what? But now this is the new reality. So we have to, to deal with it. And it's really good that we managed to, to have the deal. It was a very nice Christmas present. So without further ado, now I am Nikola Simanov and I'm going to show you and uh, talk to you about how the Brexit and the deal will impact people movement in terms of immigration and in terms of taxes. With that being said, I would like to, to make some two very important caveats. First, we are not going to talk about the settlement scheme or the re-registration because this is something more or less covered during the transition. But uh, we are going to share with you how uh, it will work for people who arrive in Bulgaria for the first time, UK nationals, or for Bulgarians who are moving uh, to the UK. And because we are uh, Bulgarian immigration advisors, we can give you the specifics for all of the Bulgarian cases. Whereas for the inbound immigration to the UK, we are going to give you the, uh, our understanding on how this works. But because this is a very specific case, uh, we would recommend that you really consult and make a separate analysis with uh, a UK-based immigration advisor. Of course, uh, if you uh, need contacts of such, we are able to help. So how does this Brexit affect your business. Let's first start with the short-term business visitors. Now, after the deal, uh, UK nationals are allowed to travel visa-free in the EU, inclusive in Bulgaria, uh, for up to 90 days within a six-month period. And in order to do so, uh, you need to have a passport, a valid UK-issued passport, uh, valid for three months uh, after your end date, expected end date of departure. So you're allowed to visit Bulgaria and stay here for 90 days without a visa. 
But okay, uh, as a business visitor, what are you able to do while doing this business visit? So there is a list of permitted activities which were negotiated in the deal. And uh, we have structured it basically into three main uh, streamlines. The first one are activities which are auxiliary to business, uh, such as attending meetings or attending trade fairs or uh, negotiating a contract, uh, senior executives visiting to negotiate a deal, or uh, after sale or after purchase support or purchase of uh, goods for, for UK companies, uh, with a very, very uh, strict limit that you are not allowed to directly supply services, directly sell or directly engage in gainful business activities generating revenue. Otherwise, you would need some sort of additional work authorization. So this is now the new reality after Brexit. The second uh, stream of activities, if I might call it like this, these are related to education and qualifications. So you can visit Bulgaria to uh, receive training. You can also visit Bulgaria to make research or design or for scientific purposes up to 90 days without a visa. And the third line, which is, I think, very interesting and important for the tourist business after uh, we are able to, to travel again for leisure, not only for business, these are the activities related to tourism. And uh, in terms of tourism, uh, tour guides or tour operators accompanying like uh, people coming here on a, let's say, leisure trip on vacation for, for a certain period of time. They are exempt also from the work authorization or work permits. Uh, up to a very limited, again, days of stay in Bulgaria. So uh, these are basically the three types of permitted activities. And of course, if you want to come here or establish a business or establish a company to incorporate a subsidiary in Bulgaria, you're also allowed to come and travel in Bulgaria and uh, do your activities without a visa. The nature of the activities are, again, auxiliary to business and from the practice of our authorities, we would say that such a business trip should not, uh, let's say, exceed seven, seven calendar days or five work days uh, in a row, because otherwise it would imply maybe a different type of activities for, for which you may, you may need a work permit. Next slide, please. So after uh, we have discussed the short-term travel, there are also, uh, let's say, some certain aspects of Bulgarian immigration law of what to do and how to arrange the immigration status of uh, UK nationals coming to Bulgaria for a longer period. So you have incorporated the company, you're bringing now your key personnel. And basically, this process requires work authorization, or like we call it, the technical term is permission to access the Bulgarian labor market or work permits. And there are different arrangements. In Bulgaria, there are three, maybe, okay, two main uh, options for uh, having uh, UK nationals work, to work in Bulgaria under let's say, employment relations. The first one is the EU Blue Card for highly qualified employment, uh, which is given to specific uh, categories of personnel, having uh, specialized education and qualification and a certain salary grade. So if you want to open a company and directly hire a UK national, uh, if he or she meets these requirements for education, like uh, three years regular university education and uh, salary 1.5 times higher than the salary average salary in Bulgaria, not for the sector, for Bulgaria for the last 12 months, you can, uh, let's say, utilize this EU blue card option. In the UK, this was not adopted, uh, even when UK was part of the EU, but you have uh, actually two other options, which are for Bulgarian nationals going to the UK. These are the uh, global talent permit or visa and the skilled worker visa. And the skilled worker uh, in many of the aspects actually uh, is pretty much the same as the EU blue card in Bulgaria. Uh, you have to collect a certain number of points to be eligible, and then you are allowed to, to work in the UK and reside. Whereas the global talent, uh, this is given to certain sort of, let's say, household names, individuals who are widely recognized as experts in their fields of work. And uh, in this case, they do not have to, let's say, qualify with specific requirements, uh, which are for the skilled workers like uh, salary, labor shortage, education, stuff like that. Uh, the other option, if you want to, to have somebody working in Bulgaria, let's say that you are a part of a multinational company group and you want to bring your key personnel. These are like managers, specialists, even trainees for, for acquiring international experience. This is the so-called intra-corporate transfer. 
or ICT. And the, the important thing uh, in the ICT is that uh, you can keep your UK contract and work in Bulgaria for a period of, let's say, three years for managers and specialists and uh, one year for trainees. The same is valid for the UK, although the UK, let's say, government has been more generous uh, towards Bulgarian nationals. So the ICT in the UK allows you five years out of six or nine years out of 10. But again, the, the same requirements apply. Companies need to be of a, let's say, same corporate group and uh, you need to really uh, move key personnel, which otherwise would have been very hard to find on the local market who, let's say, keeps their home employment contract and it returns to, to their home country after the, the assignment, let's say, is finished. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention for the UBLO card, it allows the UK nationals to stay here for a period of four years. So basically, if you go through the initial work authorization visa and residence permit process in Bulgaria, then the individual is fine to live and work here for a period of four years. For ICT, it is three years. For uh, in the mirror, let's say, situation in the UK, as I have said, the ICT is five out of six years or uh, nine out of 10 years. For skilled and uh, global talent visas, the, the rules for stay are different. One more thing, which is also very important for the promotion and for the, let's say, incentives to our business, registered executives in Bulgaria, they're exempt from the work permit requirement. So there is no limit of their stay. And after they go through the initial process of obtaining visa, and residence permits, then they are allowed to, to stay and work here in Bulgaria for a limited period, as long as they remain registered as an executive and renew their residence permits on, uh, on a timely basis. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, these are the cases when you want to directly hire somebody to work in Bulgaria or when you are a part of a company group and uh, want to send your key personnel here. But what about cases when you, let's say, are given a specific contract? For example, a UK-based company wins a contract for updating the software and the IT security of a key Bulgarian company. In this case, we are talking about contractual services suppliers. And uh, these services are permitted under the deal. However, a work authorization or a work permit is required before traveling. This is very important because when we have initially read the, the TCA, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, we thought that this was going to be exempt and we were like very happy. Wow, this is something that we wouldn't think it would happen in Bulgaria or in the EU under the deal. But it turns out that uh, certain uh, activities are permitted. However, a work authorization or a work permit is uh, anyway needed. Uh, and in this case, the, the stay of uh, such professionals coming to work in Bulgaria, it is limited to 12 months. Uh, and uh, one very important thing, uh, there is no automatic recognition of professional services or qualifications. So in Bulgaria, we have a certain thing that we call regulated professions like lawyers, architects and stuff, something like this. So if the, the person who you're bringing here for fulfillment of your contract falls within one of these categories, then additional process for recognition of the diploma has to be completed before applying for the work authorization. So the, the list of uh, activities which you can do as a contractual supplier, there are all of them listed in the TCA in the deal. So I'm not going to, let's say, elaborate on them one by one. I'll just give you, for example, as I said, uh, legal, accounting, tax, engineering, uh, translation also. Um, so it gives more or less uh, a very wide variety of things which you can do. So there is still some sort of a freedom of services. However, because now uh, the UK is considered as a third country, the, the individuals apply their sponsors, the sponsoring company in Bulgaria applying for such permits, they need uh, to, to have um, this work authorization or work permit formalities completed. And the last category, the independent professionals or the freelancers which want to come here to work in Bulgaria. These are like lawyers or architects uh, or again, uh, consultants, uh, this is something that uh, is very similar to the contractual services suppliers. However, in this specific case, the activities which can be performed in Bulgaria are listed explicitly in the agreement. So it is only what is shown in the agreement that can be done here in Bulgaria. Market research, R&D, 
management consulting, uh, IT, again, uh, construction, legal services. So you can find all of this information, the complete list of services which are permitted uh, in the TCA, in the deal. And uh, one more thing, which is very important for the independent professionals, they're not subject to, let's say, a work permit procedure, but a special freelance permit procedure, uh, which is uh, important in terms of uh, that you have to submit also a business plan. Uh, you have to know Bulgarian, which I think is a very huge stop to individuals coming to work here in Bulgaria. And it's also valid, valid for one year. Uh, basically, the, the same uh, contractual services suppliers and independent professional activities are uh, permitted in the UK, uh, subject to the requirements of the TCA. So for cases which touch the UK and which are inbound to the UK, really the situation has to be analyzed by, by an advisor who is located in the UK in order to, to, to have the complete picture. Uh, again, for independent professionals, uh, the regulated profession supply. So you need to, to see whether uh, there is something in addition to the formal permit, like recognition of the diploma that you have to do in advance. And uh, I would also like to say that uh, in terms of um, information, which is publicly available on all of what is happening after Brexit, British government has actually published a very useful guide on the points visa system. The, um, uh, requirements for getting both the highly skilled worker visa, the global talent visa, the highly skilled worker the international health services, the ICT. So this is publicly available and it is published on the gov.uk website. So it is easily accessible. Uh, I will also share with you the organizers of the webinar after we finish with the today's event so that uh, you can receive it upon request and see really what, what the requirements are. And uh, with that being said, I think we're finishing with the immigration aspect. So we have talked about short-term business travel, long-term work, contractual suppliers and independent consultants. And I would like to share a little bit with you about taxes. So next slide, please. Apart from uh, people movement and uh, freedom of movement throughout the EU, there are also some questions which are coming with respect to taxes and social security. Because, you know, during the last more than 30 years when UK has been part of the EU, we had this thing called the coordination of social security systems. There was uh, coverage and recognition of insurable periods. We also have a double tax treaty with the UK. So what can we say about this? The UK, uh, Bulgaria Double Tax Treaty, it will remain effective. It remains in force. It is not influenced by Brexit in any way. So uh, the provision would still be applicable. However, there are some restrictions under Bulgarian tax law which you need to be aware of. For example, uh, under Bulgarian law, individuals who receive capital gains from, let's say, sale of shares or disposal of uh, securities, which are traded on a European stock exchange, these positive capital gains are exempt from tax in Bulgaria and they're not reportable in Bulgaria. Before Brexit, this was valid also for the UK. However, effective 2021, if you do realize a capital gain on a London, let's say, stock exchange, the rules exempting it from tax in Bulgaria will not apply any longer. So it will be the general provision of Bulgarian tax law and capital gains will be taxable here. Uh, this is one of the example changes which happens in terms of taxes. What about social security? I think this is the heavier topic uh, because uh, historically there has never been a social security agreement between Bulgaria and the UK. So now after Brexit is a fact and uh, after uh, the UK is no longer part of the EU, the regulations on social security will cease to apply. So for uh, individuals who have just arrived in Bulgaria, that, that there is, will be no social security coverage. So if you want to sign a Bulgarian labor contract, the social security will be uh, under the conditions for the rest of the third country, non-EU or EEA nationals. And the length of service in Bulgaria, which will gather as of uh, 1st of January 2021, will not be recognized in the UK and vice versa. This, however, will not impact the individuals who are in status quo, meaning the individuals who have received their residence permits or have pre-registered within the uh, withdrawal period, which was until the end of 2020. 
And uh, by the way, the deadline for re-registration has been extended until the end of 2021. So if somebody hasn't done it, now is the time to do it. But such individuals in a status quo position, they will not be affected by this, let's say, seizure of social security coverage. Their rights will remain and they will keep them and the uh, insurable periods will count uh, for, for, let's say, for pension purposes, for example, until their current immigration documents issued in Bulgaria before 2021 expire. Uh, and by issued, I also mean issued or re-registered before the 2021. Uh, I know that this is a lot of information and I know that it may be more uh, than it has to be given in 20 minutes. So I apologize if it has, if it has been really concise and let's say short, but I'm also available now for your questions. So I'm going to see if anybody has asked. And yeah, so the floor is now given to the participants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikki. I had a couple of questions in mind, but you already responded to them during your very comprehensive presentation. I would like to invite all our participants to post their questions in the Q&A section now. I don't see any questions at this stage. If we don't have any, we can move in a few seconds to, to the next presentation. And of course, Nicola will be available to respond to your questions later or in writing after the webinar. And uh, yeah, while you think about questions, I can also, let's say, because we have two more minutes, tell you about the so-called settlement scheme in the UK. It is the same as the re-registration as I have promised. Uh, okay, so I have a question. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I know that under the trade and cooperation agreement, the deadline was uh, June 30th, 2021. And I think this is going to be applicable now. Yeah, sorry. I'll start again with the question, answering life. You mentioned that the registration period has been extended to the end of 2021. Is this in Bulgaria or in the UK? This is in Bulgaria. Under the general provisions of the deal, the deadline for re-registration is end of June, 30th of June 2021. However, the, the guidelines published by Bulgarian immigration authorities, the Migration Directorate, they have said that all of the individuals whose residence permits expire in 2021, UK nationals, uh, have the opportunity to, to re-register until December 31st, 2021. Okay. Thank you very much for your response. Any other questions from the participants? Just a thank you. <laughs> and Tim, thank you for sharing a link with all the panelists and participants. Great. Okay, I think at this stage we can move on. And of course, if you have um, more questions to Nicola, please uh, share them and he will respond later. Thank you very much, Nikki, for, for your very informative and comprehensive presentation. Now we will move on to the next also very important topic, post-Brexit protection of European trademarks. Sonia Stoyanova from DGKV will cover the topic for us. Sonia, the floor is yours. Uh, I hope you're hearing me now. Okay, um, I'm Sonia Stoyanova, I'm associate at DGKV, and I'll briefly explain how Brexit will impact the protection of European trademarks. On our first slide, we can see the table of contents. For the purposes of this presentation, I have divided the trademarks into three uh, categories, European trademark registrations, applications, as well as international registrations designating the European Union as a territory of protection. In the end, I'll briefly explain the new rules for service um, with the UK's Intellectual Property Office. Next slide, please. Um, under the terms with the withdrawal agreement uh, concluded between the United Kingdom and the European Union, the United Kingdom has to ensure continuity of protection of these categories of trademarks. As of the end of the transition period on 31st December last year, these trademarks are no longer protected in the United Kingdom. Their territorial scope of protection is now being limited to the remaining 27 member states. However, the UK's Intellectual Property Office has to ensure continuity of protection 
uh, on its territory and it has undertaken various steps in order to comply with this requirement. On the next slide, we'll see uh, what is the approach of the UK's intellectual property office with respect to the registrations. As I said, they're no longer covered in the United Kingdom as a matter of EU law. However, the office has created comparable UK trademarks uh, for every registered EU trademark, uh, which means that it has to be, uh, it has to have registered status as of the end of the transition period, as of 31st December last year. Uh, next slide, please. This new comparable UK trademark is granted automatically, which means that no action uh, from the trademark owner is required. It is free of charge, and the UK's Intellectual Property Office has stated that this transition will be done with as little administration involved as possible. Uh, it's interesting that no certificate will be issued for these trademarks, but they will be recorded in the UK's Intellectual Property Office register, and everyone can check and verify its details online. It will it will refer to the same sign and the same goods and services. So here we don't have any difference in the scope of protection. The most important aspect is, is that it will keep the original filing date of the corresponding European trademark. And it will also keep the renewal date of the corresponding European trademark. This means that, for example, if your trademark expires on, let's say, 1st February this year, you will have to renew not only your European trademark, but also your new comparable UK trademark, and you will have to pay separate renewal fees, which in certain cases can be burdensome. Next slide, please. Here, I wanted to stress on the fact that these new comparable UK trademarks are fully independent from the European trademarks uh, from which they're derived they can be uh, separately challenged, uh, renewed, licensed, or assigned. And this means, for example, you can decide to renew only your new UK trademark and to abandon your European registration, or you can license only your new trademark, and this will have no effect, no impact on your European registration. Next slide, please. Here, as you can see, we have the opt-out option available if the trademark owner um, doesn't want uh, the comparable UK trademark. Uh, in order to do so, uh, the trademark owner has to file uh, an opt-out request. The request has to follow a template which is available on gov.uk. and It has to contain some mandatory requisites such as the registration number of the corresponding European trademark and details of anyone um, who has an interest in the, in the trademark. As a result, it will be deregistered from the UK's trademark register, and it will be treated as if it had never been applied for or registered under UK law. This is very important for someone that has um, concluded an agreement where they stated they will never register a trademark in the United Kingdom, and if they do not opt out, they will be in breach of such, uh, such an agreement, even though they hadn't done anything because this whole process is automatic and no action is required on their part. Next slide, please. Uh, here we see how the applications will be handled. Again, um, they won't be automatically transferred in the UK's register. Uh, comparable UK trademarks will be created only for European trademarks uh, with registered status as of the end of the transition period. If, you, if your trademark is not registered and you still have the application pending before the European Intellectual Property Office, um, you'll be entitled in nine month period of time, uh, which means until the end of September, to file for the same trademark before the UK's Intellectual Property Office. In this way, you will have the opportunity to keep your filing date of the corresponding European application, which is very important. Um, in order to do so, the applications have to meet two conditions. We'll see them on the next slide. The first condition is that uh, the application pending before the EU's intellectual property office has to have a filing date prior to the end of the transition period. And the second application that you can 
apply for before the UK's intellectual property office has to be submitted within this nine month period until 30 September this year. Next slide, please. The application shall refer to the same sign and to goods or services which are identical with or contained within those for which the application before the European Intellectual Property Office is pending. Uh, as I said, in this way, you have uh, the opportunity to keep the filing date of the European application and it will be treated by the UK's office as UK application. This means that it will be examined under UK law for any grounds for refusal of the registration. The downside here is that the standard fees of the UK's office apply. I believe they are 170 pounds for one class of goods and services and 50 pounds for um, additional classes. Next slide, please. And the last section is the international registrations designating the European Union as a territory of protection. Uh, the approach here uh, is very similar to the European registrations. They no longer cover the UK. However, the UK's office will create um, comparable trademarks for every international trademark designating the European Union, which has uh, protected status as of the end of the transition period. Uh, on the next slide, we'll see uh, some more similarities in the approach. Uh, the process again is automatic and it's free of charge. It protects the same sign and the same goods and services. And again, no certificate will be issued for these trademarks. The difference here is with the filing and the registration date, they have to correspond to the date on which protection in the European has been conferred. This means that if you have um, designated the European Union uh, with your initial application for international registration, these filing and registration dates will correspond to your registration date of the international trademark. If you have designated the European Union at a later stage, which is also possible with international registrations, these filing and registration dates will correspond to that later date. Uh, again, the renewal date uh, will correspond either to the subsequent EU designation or to the original international registration date. And again, this international comparable trademark will um, be fully independent from the respective international trademark. Next slide, please. Again, as we can see, uh, we have the opt out option and the procedure is the same. Here I want to point out that uh, in certain cases, the opt-out option is actually not available to the trademark owners. These cases include uh, if the trademark owner has used the trademark in the United Kingdom, or if uh, he has initiated litigation proceedings based on this new comparable trademark, or for example, has transferred or assigned the new comparable trademark. In such cases, if the UK's intellectual property office decides that the opt-out option has been exercised in circumstances where it uh, was not permitted and already the trademark has been removed from the register, the trademark will be reinstated in the UK's trademark register. And as our last section on the next trademark, we'll uh, briefly explain the address for service rules. Uh, first, let's clarify what's address for service. It's the address that you use to uh, correspond with the UK's intellectual property office. Um, this can be your personal address or you can provide the address of your attorney or your intellectual property representative. On the next slide, um, recently the UK intellectual property office decided to change its rules uh, with respect to correspondence addresses. Uh, and the reference to the European economic area was removed. Before the changes, which means before 31st uh, December last year, addresses in the United Kingdom, in the Channel Islands or EA uh, were accepted for correspondence purposes. On the next slide, we'll see that after the amendments, only addresses in the United Kingdom, including the Isle of Man, in Gibraltar or in the Channel Islands are accepted. Here we have temporary exception with respect to the trademark owners of the new comparable UK trademarks. They have the opportunity to retain their addresses in the European economic area for three year period of time, 
which means um, before uh, 30, uh, before 1st January 2024. Uh, in this three year period of time, if they need to change their address, they are not limited uh, by the new rules. They still can change their address in another uh, European economic area address. Uh, and it's important at the end to point out that this exception does not cover comparable trademarks created from international registration. Um, so trademark owners of such comparable trademarks based on international registrations already have to comply with this requirement as of 1st January this year. And uh, I believe this is the, the last slide. Thank you very much, Sonia, for your interesting and very exhaustive presentation. Now I would like to ask the attendees to ask their questions in the Q&A section, if you have any. Of course, you have the opportunity to ask Sonia after the webinar, but if you ask in the Q&A section, everybody will be able to, to uh, listen to the response, which might be useful to the other attendees as well. Okay, no questions at this stage. Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you. I suggest we move on to the third presentation on our agenda. Yeah, let's see here the contact details for GGKV. Feel free to contact them. If you want to, to contact uh, Nicola, please, uh, uh, for the first presentation, please contact us and we will be able to, and happy to put you in contact. Now let's move on. Customs and VAT implications of Brexit. Uh, we have a guest speaker from Kamburuf and Partners Tax Consulting, collaborating firm of Anderson Global, Alexandra Kalinowska. Alexandra, please, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Alexandra Kalinowska. I'm um, a partner from uh, Anderson uh, Poland. Uh, I'm coordinator of VAT and Customs Group. At Anderson, I was invited by my friend from Kamburov, uh, Bulgaria, uh, Benitsa Dimitrova, and I have a pleasure to uh, to present some post Brexit uh, issues regarding customs and VAT. It's a very large subject, so uh, I will concentrate on the most uh, important aspects. But uh, I hope that you will have a lot of questions, and I will be happy to answer them. Next slide, please. Uh, we can uh, move forward. Okay, so um, uh, Brexit has a um, very huge impact on international trade. And uh, if you look um, uh, at the international trade uh, of, of the UK, um, the EU is really important uh, uh, business partner uh, in terms of uh, exchanging of, of, of goods. Um, and uh, of course, uh, that there is huge uh, trade with um, outside the, the, the EU. Uh, however, taking into consideration that uh, uh, approximately half of, of international trade is uh, trade with the EU, we can imagine how uh, um, Brexit uh, um, created a lot of problems, uh, practical problems uh, in international um, trade, uh, because uh, since 1st of January, uh, we have customs borders, so all the goods which are imported and exported from the UK to, to Europe and the other way around, they, they should be subject to, to customs controls. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So, um, as Tim mentioned, um, the, that there is a good news uh, that the European Union uh, and, and uh, the um, United Kingdom um, 
signed the uh, the free trade agreement. Uh, it is a draft of the agreement, and it is subject um, to to implementation uh, by, by the EU countries. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Uh, the free trade agreement uh, covers um, economy and, and trade, so uh, the, the most important areas are, of course, trade in goods, trade in services and investments, financial services, digital trade, capital market, uh, level playing field, intellectual property, which was discussed today, public procurement but also other areas like environment, uh, security partnership, fisheries. That was a uh, very sensitive uh, subject during negotiations and uh, cross-border transport and uh, civil nuclear. Uh, today, we will concentrate on um, trade of goods and, and trade of services uh, from customs and VAT perspective. So can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, so, uh, just to, to compare the situation um, until the end of uh, 2020, um, the international trade between the UK and the EU was quite easy because uh, the goods um, moved from the UK to, uh, for example, to, to France. Um, they were subject to 0% VAT rate, and it was intra-community supply uh, from the UK perspective, no customs clearance, uh, no uh, any additional documents uh, were needed when goods moved um, from one uh, country to another, and vice versa, if the goods were transported from France to, to the UK, it was quite easy, no, no uh, controls at the borders. Um, and now, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, from 1st January this year, the situation um, is totally different. Uh, of course, uh, still there is a possibility to apply the 0% VAT rate uh, on the movements from the UK to Europe and, and the other way around. However, uh, the, the difference is that such goods has to go through the customs office. They are subject to, to customs clearances and, and uh, controls. And uh, therefore, um, uh, transporting the goods um, both ways requires more, more time. And uh, in practice, um, uh, such a big difference created a lot of practical problems. Um, especially uh, in ports, um, because um, the logistic firms were not uh, prepared for such a, a big change. Um, we hope that it will uh, be more uh, easy in the future uh, when, when uh, the companies will adjust to, to the new situation. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So uh, as Tim uh, said, uh, the, the free trade agreement uh, sets 0% tariff rate uh, for all the goods, uh, all the products originating in the EU or uh, in the UK. Um, and this is very important uh, because uh, the origin uh, uh, has to be checked regarding every type of product. So, for example, if um, the company located uh, in Poland uh, imports some electronic products uh, from Asia, from China, and would like to export those goods uh, to the UK, uh, these goods will not have the preferential origin uh, because they are not uh, processed, uh, manufactured uh, in the EU are just imported to, to the EU and re-exported uh, to the UK. So in such a case, we have to check the, the origin and what is uh, the customs duty rate applicable uh, in the UK. Uh, the free trade agreement eliminates also all types of uh, quotas for almost all of goods, but there are some exceptions. Uh, there are quotas uh, for um, some fishes like canned tuna, 
uh, skip checks and the bonito and uh, other canned fish and also for some aluminum products um, classified under certain CM codes. Um, so it means there are limitations for exports of, of such products um, from both ways. And uh, also very important uh, regulation, um, uh, exclusion for next two years, uh, so-called prohibition uh, of drawback or exemption um, from uh, customs duty uh, for non-originating goods used in manufacture of uh, products for which uh, proof of origin uh, is issued. Uh, what it means in practice? Can we move to, to the next slide, please? Um, so let's let's imagine that we have a manufacturing facility uh, in Poland and uh, or Bulgaria, and uh, the producer uh, imports some components from Taiwan and also uh, purchases some um, components uh, originating uh, in Poland or in other European uh, country, and also. Uh, uses components uh, which are subject to intra-community acquisitions uh, from other um, European uh, countries. And uh, let's assume that uh, such final product um, obtains preferential origin. And when such product is exported uh, to the UK, uh, the producer is allowed to confirm preferential origin uh, on the invoice. Um, however, when importing goods from, for example, Taiwan, uh, the Polish producer can benefit uh, uh, from customs duty drawback or suspension of customs duty when the Polish producer will use inward processing procedure. This procedure allows uh, to import uh, components from outside the EU and to suspend or, or um, gives um, possibility to, to apply for a customs duty refund, even though uh, that uh, the products exported to the UK uh, obtain the European origin and even if this origin uh, is confirmed um, on the invoice. Uh, so this is very beneficiary um, under the, the free trade agreement. Um, and uh, this rule was introduced uh, only for two years. And uh, the agreement says that the parties will analyze the situation. So let's hope that it will be maintained for the future uh, because uh, su such rule um, protects um, the, the, the interests of, of the European um, uh, producers. Uh, otherwise, if such rule is introduced, if the rule um, will say that the, there is, um, um, that the producer has to choose um, either to, to benefit from uh, suspension of customs duty or to confirm uh, the preferential origin, um, it will result in um, higher costs of, of production uh, in Europe. So um, from the UK perspective, um, the UK importers uh, could be interested in imports of goods directly from, from Taiwan or, or China than uh, on import of goods from Europe if they will be uh, more expensive. Okay, can we move to, to the next slide, please? So, um, talking about uh, impact of, of Brexit on uh, international trade, um, as I said, uh, mainly a lot of customs uh, formalities. Uh, some of, of the companies uh, which were not involved uh, in import export before when trading with the UK because uh, before um, 1st January this year, such transactions were treated as intra-community transactions. 
uh, but now so, uh, the importers, exporters uh, should apply for so-called uh, ORI numbers to be able to uh, submit customs declarations. In some cases, um, the companies should uh, perform VAT registration. And I can give you a practical example. Um, Polish um, company uh, supplies goods uh, to, to the UK, uh, to the big uh, re retail network. And uh, before uh, 1st of January, it was easy. It was just intra-community supply. Um, from 1st of January, these goods should be declared for export from Polish perspective and import from the UK perspective. And um, the UK uh, retail network said that, okay, uh, but we are not interested to be involved in any import customs clearances uh, because we would like to, to, to get uh, goods uh, <laughs> to our stores, which are already customs cleared, and that's it. So um, in order to maintain this business relationship, uh, the Polish exporter uh, is obliged to, to register for VAT in the UK and to apply for a ORI number in the UK and to take care um, about the customs formalities uh, in the UK. So uh, sometimes it could be uh, more, um, more difficult than it was before. And uh, of course, there are some physical checks uh, of the goods on the border. And even though that uh, uh, the simplified customs declarations uh, can be submitted, but the, the customs authorities, they, they can uh, check the goods uh, at the border. So it, uh, it could result in delays in deliveries of, of goods. And actually, it happens, especially um, in cases when um, the traders were not uh, prepared for, for such change. Yes, if they have not applied um, for ORI numbers before 1st of January and so on and so on, it takes time to, um, to fill in all those uh, formalities. Um, and also, um, Customs procedures uh, like bonded warehouses, inward and outward processing, and so on. Uh, these procedures can be used um, in international trade between the UK and, and uh, the EU. But uh, again, uh, this uh, requires uh, more formalities, yes, obtaining special permits from the customs authorities. Um, customs compliance, etc., uh, etc. Et but uh, sometimes these procedures are, of course, uh, beneficiary. So, for, for example, uh, before first um, of January, uh, the, the, there were some regulations regarding um, call of stocks, uh, simplification for call of stocks. Uh, after 1st of January, if the goods are sent uh, from the UK, for example, to, to Europe, uh, the simplification for call of stocks in the EU doesn't work in relation to, to the goods which are transported from the UK. Uh, so in order to, to achieve the, the same effect, uh, the, the goods can be placed, for example, in a bonded warehouse uh, in the EU, but it requires additional additional uh, arrangement, additional uh, permits, uh, and so on. So, um, so the change requires um, different uh, planning and and uh, different different regimes. Um, the, the origin of goods, of course, uh, uh, the free trade agreement uh, provides for simplification that if the goods uh, obtain the preferential origin, an exporter is allowed to 
um, confirm such origin on the invoice. But um, we, we have to be aware that uh, the exporter is responsible for, for this. So uh, in other words, the, tax, uh, the, the customs authorities can perform uh, post-import audit and check whether the goods really <laughs> obtain the uh, preferential origin. Uh, if this is not true, then uh, penalties can, can be imposed uh, on the exporter who confirmed uh, the origin. And if it was not true, then litigation can, can start. And uh, maybe a few words about the services, um, because the major impact on the services um, relates to electronic and uh, broadcasting services, because uh, in the EU uh, there is simplification, mini one-stop shop. And uh, for some companies from outside the EU, for example, the, the US businesses, um, um, which established a uh, mini one-stop shop in the UK, and it worked for the whole Europe, uh, now it doesn't work. It means that uh, such companies should, should create a uh, mini one-stop shop in uh, another uh, EU, EU country. So this is the, the major impact um, on the services. Mm. Okay, um, I think uh, I, I tried to, to present you some very important um, topics uh, in a nutshell because we have very limited time, but uh, I can see that there are some questions. Um, Thank you very much, Alexandra. If you could see the questions in the Q&A section if, yes. uh, if you could click answer live and read them so everybody can understand the question and then we're looking forward to your responses. Okay, first question. In case uh, EU company possesses VAT and IORI registration in the UK, not registered branch, only tax and customs registration, is it possible to import goods from EU into UK uh, and request recovery of the import paid uh, in the UK afterwards. Yes, if the company is registered for VAT in the UK, um, such company can, can get uh, the, the VAT uh, in the UK uh, back through the uh, VAT return. Uh, okay, next question. Are the individuals ordering from the UK required to obtain an EORI number? Uh, the individuals, uh, I mean, physical persons uh, who are uh, importing goods, they are not uh, obliged to get an ORI number. This is only for, for the businesses. Uh, next question, uh, what would be the supporting documentation for the import of goods in Bulga Bulgaria or Poland, EU in general, from UK? with CMR customs declaration uh, and so on. But if the goods are just uh, transferred between two entities with the customs required invoice to, um, which we lack, there is no actual trading and uh, just transfer. Uh, in such cases, uh, the, the invoice for customs purposes would be requ required. It could be pro forma invoice because uh, even though that, that there is only transfer of goods, it is import and export. And uh, when we are importing goods uh, to the EU, um, we have to um, determine the customs value. Yes, and uh, th that's why the, the pro forma invoice or um, customs invoice is required to, to prove the customs value. Next question. Uh, I am a Bulgarian company and need to arrange for spare parts uh, to be sent from the UK uh, to a customer of uh, mine in Germany. Can I clear the goods in Bulgaria, pay 
uh, VAT to import uh, into the EU, but have them delivered directly to Germany. Um, in such case, uh, because the, the customs clearance uh, takes place where the goods are physically uh, presented to, to customs. So uh, if you would like to bring goods directly from the UK to, to Germany, uh, you can perform the, the customs clearance uh, in Germany, but uh, in such a case, uh, the VAT registration will be necessary. But uh, if you use so-called uh, procedure, customs procedure uh, 42, then if you perform import in another country, for example, um, Netherlands or, or Poland, uh, and uh, the goods will be directly uh, sent uh, to, to, to Germany, then uh, you can avoid the, the VAT registration in the country of, of import, importation because uh, the exemption works. And uh, in such a case, uh, the logistic uh, company, sorry, I have some <laughs> problem with the light <laughs> in my office, but I hope you can see me. Uh, okay. And the next uh, question, um, what tax should be indicated uh, on the exporter's invoice in order to prove uh, the origin? Um, I, I can, uh, I will um, answer this in, in writing because I have to check the wording in the free trade agreement. Okay, and then there is a question uh, if a UK citizen who is legally uh, residing in Bulgaria before the transition period, meaning um, they have valid residency permit, wants to bring over their personal stuff, furniture, white goods, clothes, etc., can they do this without being charged VAT for those personal goods? Uh, Generally, the, 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 there are exemptions from uh, customs duty and, and uh, import VAT uh, for uh, import of uh, belongings. Uh, I'm not sure uh, about the um, local uh, Bulgarian VAT legislation, but I hope that, that there is such a regulation, the, the VAT exemption for, for the goods which are uh, brought as, as personal uh, belongings. Um, okay, and the last question. Uh, does empty packaging imported uh, into EU from UK uh, travel declaration free uh, by means or oral decla declaration, uh, declaration by conduct? Um, Okay, I will answer <laughs> this question in writing because I, I have to I have to check uh, the, the details. Next question uh, is the same in Bulgaria. Uh, okay, so someone uh, Denitsa answered that in Bulgaria also that there is um, there is uh, regulation uh, which allows uh, to uh, to exempt from VAT the personal belongings. So this is the answer to the previous question. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for your expert advice. Quite uh, a few questions and very specific. Uh, we appreciate your uh, responses. If we have, uh, I think there is one more, actually, a thank you, well deserved. Thank you very much for you. your presentation and also for uh, your responses. Now, I suggest we move to the last presentation for today's session, which uh, is focused on Brexit's impact on cross-border dispute resolution. I would like to invite Kamen Scholle from New Balkans Law Office. Kamen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
Well, I shall start by uh, briefly um, introducing our firm. Uh, New Balkans Law Office is a mid-sized uh, Bulgarian firm, but we unusually somewhat have a presence in London. We um, are busy with cross-border investments, uh, with matters of regulation, and with disputes, which is the topic of today. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Um, our disputes team um, has six lawyers, and um, I am one of these lawyers, uh, and uh, I am, uh, again, somewhat unusually dual qualified uh, as an English barrister as well as a Bulgarian advocate. Um, quite a few of our cases are cross-border between these two jurisdictions, and uh, I may get a chance to mention of some of them in the context of our experience um, when, I, uh, when I discuss uh, the topic later on today. Um, of course, we uh, will welcome any further questions after today's um, webinar from you, and uh, if we can be of any assistance, we'll be most happy to. Uh, next slide, please. And indeed, uh, the next one after that. Um, what the uh, effect of um, Brexit and the agreements that followed it uh, is on uh, cross-border dispute resolution uh, is, of course, a rather large topic. And I cannot hope to cover today everything that uh, you might want to know about it in, in any level of detail. What I'm hoping instead just to give you is just to give you an idea of um, the shape of things and um, uh, uh, to, to give you a sense of um, where to look for information or what kind of information uh, to have in mind. Um, I should say that although um, the title of my talk is uh, the cross-border aspects between Bulgaria and the UK, um, both of these jurisdictions, both Bulgaria and the UK, may find that there are parties from other jurisdictions um, that are using the courts um, or the dispute resolution system of the relevant uh, other jurisdiction to um, resolve their disputes, so non-Bulgarian, non-UK parties. Well, there may be uh, judgments that are uh, given in other courts and that have some role to play. Um, and to some extent, these will also be covered by today's talk. But uh, what the talk uh, will focus on is commercial and civil matters, so uh, excluding However, matters of employment, um, disputes involving a party that is a consumer, intellectual property, and insolvency law. Um, I will not, today's talk will generally not be relevant uh, to those of you who may be interested in family uh, matters, in the financial aspects of divorce, uh, in cross-border child law, and other personal matters. Also, to um, exclude from scope uh, is uh, broadly Scotland and Northern Ireland, which, as you may know, have their own separate legal systems. And also both the Crown Dependencies and the British Overseas Territories, uh, which uh, between them include places such as the Channel Islands, the Isle of Man, Gibraltar, and others, which uh, can be commercially highly relevant, um, but they are not uh, necessarily covered by today. If I can convey a broad message of what's the, the effect um, of uh, Brexit on dispute resolution. It is that um, a lot uh, of the work that had been done by the European Union, um, including the UK as part of the European Union over the last um, so many years, uh, is uh, now um, no longer necessarily relevant. Um, and uh, this um, creates uh, a number of um, number of potential difficulties, um, and I will describe some of them, but it may also create a number of opportunities, uh, and those are not to be completely forgotten about. Um, of course, none of these difficulties are difficulties that good advice um, from lawyers will not resolve, uh, and both London and Bulgaria have um, plenty of good lawyers. Um, next slide, please. So the first um, question that one should consider uh, on a journey uh, of resolving a dispute, uh, once it's become clear that there is a dispute, uh, is what, 
court to turn to, unless, of course, there is an arbitration provision, which I will return to later on. And uh, then the question will arise of, does that court have jurisdiction and will it accept jurisdiction? The position so far has been dealt with uh, under the uh, Brussels regime, and specifically the Brussels recast regulation. Um, and that will no longer apply after the 1st of January of this year, uh, the so-called transition period end date. Um, instead, what will apply to courts deciding whether it should accept jurisdiction or should not uh, are uh, other matters, uh, other, other rules, and uh, rather. And uh, the first one to look at is the Hague Convention of 2005. This uh, applies between the UK and, and the member states of the European Union, but it only applies to a specific group uh, of situations. And these are situations where there has been uh, an exclusive jurisdiction agreement uh, contained within an agreement, presumably uh, broadly in a contractual context. And it's only in those cases that Hague 2005 applies. Outside of those cases, uh, in uh, England and Wales, the so-called traditional rules apply. The English traditional rules are rather uh, strange from the point of view of, of a Bulgarian or continental jurist um, person, and uh, they're based mainly on the presence uh, of the defendant or respondent, perhaps, within the English jurisdiction. So where King's Writ can reach such a, such a defendant, where they can be served, papers can be perhaps um, thrown in sufficient proximity right next to them and um, the process server can shout out to them, uh, you are served, sir, uh, perhaps identifying them by name, then uh, that may be enough, even if they are only transiently present in principle, that may be enough to establish jurisdiction over that individual being served. Um, this, of course, means that there are situations where somebody gets served in this way and uh, there are various very good reasons why they shouldn't, why the um, proceedings shouldn't proceed in England. And therefore, England has rules um, which are beyond the scope of today uh, under the broad rubric of foreign convenience to deal and, and non-convenience to deal with uh, the question of whether they should in fact be, um, be sued in the English courts. If the individual is not present in England um, or cannot be served for whatever practical reason in England, uh, then it's a matter of uh, getting the court's permission to serve them. Uh, and that happens in a, a specific set of ways that are set out in the civil procedure rules in England and in relevant case law. Uh, next slide, please. One innovation which may suggest um, the way in which um, this area is going to develop in future with, with perhaps a partial return to the facility of service uh, under the uh, Brussels regime uh, is a new rule unilaterally in England, which is, uh, which is rule 633.2c of the CPR, the civil procedure rules, which um, allows service uh, where there is uh, a contractual provision in favor of the English courts. So where the parties have agreed that it's um, jurisdiction of the English courts, there's no requirement to ask for permission from the English courts to serve. That doesn't apply in the other direction. And looking at the Bulgarian rules, having already discussed the Hague Convention of 2005 in the opposite direction, um, the traditional rules of, of Bulgaria, of the uh, private international law code of Bulgaria will apply as to the Bulgarian courts deciding whether or not to take jurisdiction in a given case. In the commercial context where the claimant is a Bulgarian person or the defendant is either habitually resident or is a company or other organization that has its seat in Bulgaria, that's the general basis for Bulgarian courts generally taking jurisdiction. There are uh, special rules, um, situations concerning property, uh, situations where perhaps the defendant has their main place of business in Bulgaria or whether there's some characteristic or other performance of a contract that must happen in Bulgaria as the parties see it. Next slide, please. Um, once you have dealt with the question of um, will the courts accept jurisdiction, the next question may well be um, 
how can you serve abroad? And, and, and that we saw in the context of England is actually relevant to the question of jurisdiction. But um, there, are, uh, there are practical aspects of it and there are questions about the methods of service. There is another, um, in case you are wondering um, the, the frequency of, of the mention of the Dutch city, another Hague convention from 1965, uh, and that deals with service. In England in particular, one should also keep in mind that there are uh, strict provisions uh, which require keeping to a, uh, normally six months or, or an extended period with the permission of the court within which service must be effected. Um, and uh, there is under the Hague Convention as well, a uh, provision for service between, from Bulgaria into, into England and Wales. What um, you should keep in mind, however, is that service in, through these uh, Hague Convention routes relies on the central authorities of the two uh, countries. And those central authorities, efficient as they may be, are still relatively slow by commercial standards. Uh, it may take four to 12 months and may therefore skip over that period of six months uh, in case of uh, English proceedings being served. And so you may need to plan for um, an extension of time. And uh, you may also be well advised to plan in advance for an address for service to be contractually agreed, which may help you. Um, next slide, please. Um, having dealt with the previous questions, another question you may be wondering about is, well, um, what's the point of suing unless you can secure some assets? And um, there is, of course, a freezing injunction that one can uh, make use of in England and, and an equivalent provision in Bulgaria. In England, the freezing injunction is uh, not issued in theory that likely it's, it's considered a nuclear option. Um, and in Bulgaria, it's issued somewhat more likely, less nuclear. Um, but um, those uh, provisions uh, are, uh, while they were relatively easy to apply before the 1st of January this year, and indeed that same, um, that same fact applies also to freezing injunctions that you equipped yourself with before the 1st of January, or uh, that you might equip yourself with in proceedings that were started before the 1st of January, after the 1st of January, uh, one should, um, should be much warier uh, and should seek detailed advice on uh, whether that will be enforceable. Um, the English courts uh, will generally require reciprocity and between both Bulgaria and England, there will be questions of whether uh, the injunction, uh, whatever description it is, uh, is available in national law or whether if it's not available, for example, against third parties, perhaps there may be difficulties whether there uh, is some, uh, some reason why it might be uh, the subject of, of satellite litigation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in addition to securing assets to hopefully enforce against, you might also want to secure evidence and information. Um, and uh, there are a range of remedies that English courts offer. Um, those remedies include, for example, Norwich Pharmacal orders under which you can uh, obtain an order from the court for documents to be disclosed by a third party and related to the proceedings. The Bulgarian courts, on the other hand, tend to be much more uh, timid in how far they are prepared to exercise this jurisdiction abroad. Uh, they were so timid in our experience um, before uh, Brexit, but they will likely be even more timid in the future. Um, and uh, that would also apply um, perhaps to the enforcement of English courts remedies of this type, unfortunately. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, um, broadly the same characterizes the taking of evidence from witnesses. Um, the regulation, the EU regulation on that subject applies, but only to proceedings which were started before uh, the end of the transition period. And for anything else, uh, starting after that, uh, it's a Hague Convention, this time from 1970, uh, which again uses the system of um, central authorities and letters of rogatory or letters of request, um, which tend to take time and uh, may be denied by courts where they feel that that will unduly delay the process, perhaps. Um, the uh, question of whether experts uh, will be more or less available in future 
Bulgarian courts are generally reluctant to uh, hear from foreign experts. They like their own um, homegrown experts that are on their uh, rotors, uh, and those might include, uh, subject to freedom of um, provision of services provisions, uh, those might include uh, UK-based experts, uh, potentially. They, uh, they don't necessarily have to, but freshly, freshly found and unincluded in the list, experts might not be uh, so uh, readily uh, available in those proceedings. Conversely, in England, um, it shouldn't change things too much. English courts would generally like to hear from anyone who um, can justifiably, justifiably be regarded as an expert. Next slide, please. Um, having dealt with the kind of course of, of proceedings and the trial, um, the question is what happens at the end once you get uh, a judgment. Um, for proceedings which started again uh, before the end of transition, uh, those are safe. However, for others, unless they come within the Hague 2005 scope, uh, the uh, exclusive agreements, uh, those now need to be dealt with as if they are just regular third uh, party, uh, third country uh, proceedings. They will require the procedure of executor, uh, which is conducted in Bulgaria for English proceedings in the Sofia City Court. Uh, and then that means that um, you are basically, for the reasons on this slide, not so certain that uh, you will persuade the court to recognize and then to uh, allow you enforcement. Or perhaps only parts of your judgment will be enforceable. Um, and uh, that will tend to give rise to uh, satellite litigation on enforcement. Next slide, please. Um, the same uh, is broadly uh, in a mirror way applicable to England and Wales, um, with the caveat that uh, in England, uh, proceedings that uh, were carried out abroad uh, may of course be challenged in a similar way to proceedings uh, that, um, that are being, whose recognition and enforcement is sought uh, in Bulgaria, um, but also that uh, if they're not challenged, if they are successfully to be enforced, then um, it is as if in English courts one is suing for a uh, money judgment, so the foreign judgment is regarded uh, as a debt, and uh, this is what, uh, what the uh, party gets to sue on in England, so it's as if um, the end result of the foreign proceedings is, is a debt that is being enforced in England, uh, which then creates difficulties where, um, where there is no direct money judgment as such. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, an area of some difficulty, um, and you will see here on this slide the word torpedoes, um, is, uh, is what happens if you have multiplicity of proceedings, proceedings that are happening at the same time or that might be happening at the same time in, in more than one jurisdiction. Under the regime before uh, the 1st of January, um, that was largely prevented. Um, but it is now uh, becoming possible once again. And um, again, uh, looking at this um, from both sides, um, it is also an opportunity. Um, and indeed, uh, at the same time, there are also provisions in England, the so-called anti-suit injunction, uh, that allow the English courts to order a, a party to not uh, take certain proceedings abroad um, on pain of being in contempt of, of the English court uh, that are used in appropriate circumstances. Uh, Bulgaria also has in its uh, code of private international law provisions to uh, prevent uh, multiplicity. Next slide, please. Um, other issues you might be concerned about are the appointment of lawyers and um, whether your, the lawyers from your home state uh, can represent you uh, abroad in, in the proceedings that you intend to have in the other country. Um, broadly speaking, that again, there, there is a watershed between the end of transition uh, proceedings starting before that and those starting after that. And um, broadly speaking, um, that's uh, that's a complicated area, and uh, it is much less available now, if at all. Um, and indeed, the pan-EU-wide provisions on legal aid are no longer available either. Uh, next slide, please. 
um, there are some procedural rights which are also uh, lost. And uh, those are, for example, European payment orders, uh, preliminary references uh, to the European courts, um, the use of uh, apostille documents uh, in order to prove certain things may be relevant, and uh, and and that uh, is now longer now no longer the case under at least um, in relation to specific documents. And uh, there are uh, also, um, however, perhaps gains, and these concern new possibilities as to jurisdiction. And next slide, please. Um, you might have also lost some rights uh, under the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms of the EU. Um, you might have lost some EU rights in relation to so-called Frankovich damages. Uh, and there may be other EU rights lost, and, and that will require analysis, of course, uh, of um, the, the TCA. Um, next slide, please. However, on the bright side, uh, you might have gained something. Um, the uh, bilateral investment treaties um, are generally abolished um, between EU member states, but uh, there is still going to be a bilateral investment treaty between Bulgaria uh, and the UK, and, and that's going to remain useful. And there are, may, uh, in addition, and again, that requires careful analysis, be gains from the TCA. Um, next slide, please. Um, arbitration, on the other hand, is relatively untouched. Uh, both Sophia and London have a place as seats of arbitration. London, of course, has its LCIA um, institution and, and ad hoc arbitrations galore otherwise. Um, so FEAR has a number of arbitration centers um, and uh, the outcomes, the awards of these arbitrations uh, are enforceable and recognizable under the New York Arbitration Convention, which just remains, carries on as if nothing has happened. And of course, um, uh, in the context of investment, investor state arbitration, the BIT I mentioned is also relevant. Anti-suit injunctions um, are relevant to arbitrations as well. Um, next slide, please. And very finally, um, mediation under the EU mediation regulation cross-border is no longer, unfortunately, available, but um, uh, that uh, does not uh, impact most commercial parties. Um, where it might do uh, is in the context of, um, of uh, mediation outcomes that parties might want to uh, seek the uh, a court order to uh, to enforce um, in a in the, the way specifically envisaged by the mediation regulation, uh, and that will no longer be um, available for fresh proceedings starting after the first of Jan. Um, with that, uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, this concludes my talk, and uh, I am available now to answer questions as well as afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carmen, for covering this important topic. I would like to encourage everyone in the audience to ask questions about cross-border disputes. We have a few thank yous for you and uh, I suppose for the whole panel that we have today. Any questions to Carmen? Or would you like to ask personally on the email that you can see on the screen now? Okay. I think no direct questions for the time being. With this, I would like to conclude uh, today's webinar, of, uh, which uh, covered all Brexit related legislation. Thank you very much for your interest. Ah, I think a question. Yeah, another thank you. <laughs> Actually, good. Uh, we would like to thank so all... no, no, no disputes um, have arisen um, during the course of my presentation, which is which is great. Which is great. Yes, I'm happy about that as well. So um, again, you can, I'm sure that after today's uh, webinar, you have uh, realized uh, that the matters are quite complex. So it's really good that we have all these experts lined up to, to respond to your questions. Please make sure that uh, you follow up with them. They are uh, there for you. And if you need any contacts or 
if you need us to, to put you in touch with any of our today's panelists, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, today's webinar is uh, recorded and we will be very happy to, to share it with all registered participants so you can follow up uh, on that and refer to all the subjects covered. We will continue to cover and to bring timely information to all of you uh, on Brexit-related matters. Some of the topics that uh, remain uh, largely open are topics related to services and especially to financial services. So we are all looking uh, for information in this respect. I would just quickly ask Tim for some uh, closing remarks and uh, then we will be uh, closing the webinar. Tim. Oh, thank you, Desi. Um, yeah, and thank you very much to all the panelists for taking part. I think, um, uh, you know, clearly there's a lot of expertise within the BBVA membership and this will become, you know, this will be extremely useful for all the members uh, as we come to grips with the new reality. Um, yes, there are a lot of changes as a result of Brexit. Um, and, you know, the changes always cause a certain amount of disruption and uh, a fear of the unknown, but I'm pretty confident that we'll find our way through this and um, uh, we'll keep business moving afterwards. Uh, as you say, Desi, there are other topics which I think will be useful to cover. And, um, you know, I look forward to helping to supporting that as well. Thank you very much for joining today. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tim. And uh, once again, thank you to our, our panelists. Uh, th th this will conclude our fourth annual tax and uh, regulatory update. Uh, thank you all for attending and looking forward to see you soon at uh, upcoming BBBA events. If some of uh, the attendees today are not members of the British Bulgarian Business Association and would like to learn more, please contact us. We will be happy to, to speak with you and to see how we can help. Wishing you all a very good evening and see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Desi.